Hello and welcome to episode 54 of the Chills of Will podcast. And as always, I'm just amazed to be sitting across the screen from such a great writer and honored and privileged to have with us, Ion Grillo. Ion Grillo is a journalist and writer based in Mexico City, working for outlets including the New York Times, France 24, and National Geographic. He's been covering Latin America since 2001 for news media such as Time Magazine, Esquire, CNN, Reuters, Reuters, pardon, uh, Al Jazeera, the Houston Chronicle, the Associated Press, Global Post, France 24, Sunday Telegraph, Letras Libras, Libres, and many others. He is the author of the books Blood Gun Money, How American, How America Arm, Ga Arms Gangs and Cartels. That's 2021, very recently. Gangster Warlords. Drug Dollars, Killing Fields, and the New Politics of Latin America from 2016, and El Narco, Inside Mexico's Criminal Insurgency from 2011. A native of England, Grill lives in Mexico City. Thanks again so much for joining me. How are you doing today? Yeah, good, thank you. Good to be thank here. You. Thanks much for, for reading and for, for, for talking. Well, you can see those three books in the back. And as I was telling yeah. you, I read El Narco in 2014. Amazon.com tells me that. And I've yeah. read the other two recently. Um, and they're just incredible reads. And we'll get into the details in a bit. But I, what I really appreciate is that you, you talk some solutions. You know, I mean, there's, there's incredible brutality and things that you that you, um, you know, investigate and that you report on and that needs to be done. But there's also solutions, right. Um, but again, thanks so much. And how did I do on the intro? Is there anything else you'd like to add? I don't know how updated that is. It's all good to me. It all sounds great to me. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Excellent. I've heard you before describe growing up in uh, Brighton. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. In just England. Outside, of, outside of the city of Brighton. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just kind of wondering what, what you were reading when you were a kid. I mean, were you a kid who was, you know, reading the newspapers and saying, you know, when you were six years old, I'm going to be a journalist. How did you kind of ease into that or, or not so much? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, so I was into writing stories from a very young age. I remember mm -hmm. being like five or six years old and kind of writing uh, stories then. A lot of my classmates were into what we call football. Okay. Um, <laughs> but I was never, I wasn't, you know, I was always uh, two left feet. Um, I was kind of into, you know, into stories and stuff. And then uh, I was very, then got very into like Dungeons and Dragons and sure. <laughs> and then, uh, and then I, I did read, um, you know, a lot, um, you know, and went from reading fantasy and adventure to reading, um, you know, classics. Uh, George Orwell was a huge yeah. inspiration. Uh, classic books like Clockwork Orange, you know, yeah. it's a great one, Brave New World, um, and these kind of things. And then um, I went a bit, had a bit more kind of going off the rails phase um, in my teenage years i mean there was a lot of drugs around my my area mm -hmm. um i had some family difficulties i had a sister who became schizophrenic made my home life difficult uh and i was very much into the kind of punk rock <laughs> See, i used to play in mm -hmm. punk rock ba uh, band oh, okay um and so i was actually a, a high school dropout uh <laughs> then and then wow. uh um you know, went to live in squats and had a kind of crazy period of my life. And then got back into education when I was um, in my early 20s. I did my, my high school equivalent in London, mm. um, in, a, in a very, very different area in, in London, then went to university. Uh, and that was when I got into to journalism. Mm. So I kind of had a had a kind of winding path sure. there rather than a straight path. <laughs> sure, sure, <laughs> right sure. Out of school is I mean, is Brighton more like like an Ibiza type thing? Is it like a like known for like a being a party place, or was? It, it is, yeah. I mean, it still is, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, I, I, mean, I joke in Mexico, it's the Acapulco of England. Okay, um, but it's kind <laughs> of mixed. In some ways, it's got a bit of a San Francisco of England in terms mm. of it's also got a big uh, gay seen uh there okay. known some as the gay capital uh but yeah it was a big um area for music for some some quite big uh rock bands mm -hmm. were based there i mean the who the band oh, okay. have a lot of links to the area 
um, and that whole mod. If you remember the, the, the film Quadrophenia, if you've seen that film, has scenes of these big fights on the beach in Brighton between mods sure. and robbers. Ah, uh, okay. And then it became uh, big in terms of the the dance nightclub scene. So that was the kind of Ibiza link. So you had a big club there, one big club there known as the Zap Club, mm -hmm. um, a, a club called the Beach. There was a, a famous DJ called Fat Boy Slim oh, from yeah. the UK who's based there and used to sponsor the the football team. Uh, so yeah, then it was so kind of big and just a big pub pub scene okay. and, lots of, and, and the, they'd have these big dances, they had these big parties on the beach there. Sure. So yeah, it's, it's a kind of party city yeah. um, as well. So that's one of the reasons why there was a lot of drugs mm -hmm. going through the area. Yeah. So the, the stories that you were writing when you were young, I mean, were those the, the fantasy type that you wrote down or were they like fiction? Were they like reporting type stories? You know, what kind of stories were you interested in? So I remember those, those, those stories when I was very young. I remember looking at some of those, went back home one time, but parents I had to clear out some old stuff, so I had to throw mm -hmm. them away. Mm -hmm. um, but they were like, I mean, these are stories from very young, but yeah, they were like, um, the night uh, Jekar brought up his gleaming broadsword to face the horrific orcs. <laughs> that was the kind of kind of stories then, very young. Um, I, I, and then I'd say, I'd say when I got a bit older, when I get into punk rock and stuff I, I would i would write some lyrics or or, or like bad poetry um, <laughs> so that was more like uh you know like the system is oppressing all the punk rocks right, will rise right. and conquer, you know? <laughs> <laughs> whatever i was writing then okay so i've got i've got a five-year-old and a three-year-old so i'm going to start getting them to write some of that type of stuff because if it leads to greatness like you you have achieved now then okay so have them write about orcs and that kind of thing and yeah, I mean, <laughs> thank, okay. you very, thank you very much. But yeah, I mean, people yeah. fall out. I guess creativity is a good thing. That yeah, yeah, it's like you can have it from a uh, that bug if you have that kind of bug of 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 uh, mm -hmm. uh, always into something. That's actually the name of, of an NWA song. I remember. Huh. That. But, 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 you know, <laughs> you're always in, you know, if, if you know, because I, I later went to music and you yes. know, you know, all these different things. But I was always into something. Always feeling sure. a need to like throw something out there. Sure. You know, have that bug. <laughs> Not that you were necessarily hanging out at the bar or the pub when you were five, but, you know, I know, for example, like Ireland is, has the famous, you know, oral tradition, qual um, you know, oral tradition and, you know, storytelling. I wonder if you got a lot of that through your family, through your culture, just storytelling in general. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, um, I remember hearing, seeing a good interview with uh, Martin Scorsese, mm -hmm. and he was describing Goodfellas and making the film Goodfellas. And he was describing the, the kids he grew up with, these Italian-American kids in New York, where he's very, very good storytellers. And he wanted yeah. to write, have the movie, sure. like yeah. the kind of very in your face, like kind of storyteller, mm -hmm. like some guys, you know, telling it to you right there. Sure. And I kind of took that to heart and I did reflect on that. And, and, and a couple of things, I mean, one, I grew up with a lot of wonderful storytellers mm -hmm. uh I mean, and this sometimes you know people sitting around the park and they're smoking you know hash or whatever back then in, in, like, in like 1988 um and you know some people there you know and everyone's sitting there and wasted and there's some guy just um, entertaining people telling these stories and giving these like you know telling these <laughs> kind of, you know, uh, or friends of mine with these you know these these, these really funny storytellers um, even some of the crazy people and even sure. some of the crazy people that you know they're making all this stuff up they can even be funny storytellers mm. um, doing that but then um, when I, I remember taking a trip back talking about the island thing I was taking a trip back uh, from Mexico one time I do have cousins in the west of Ireland mm. and I was in um, Westport with my cousin in a pub and this was before a few years before I wrote my first book but I was I was covering the drug cartel stuff for uh, for the, the newspaper the houston chronicle mm. and i was with my cousin in the pub and my cousin was like saying to the next guy oh, it's, it's my cousin he lives in mexico he's been covering drug cartels and then i tell him some story and my cousin go he did this and the way my cousin was telling the stories to the next guy in the pub i thought that's how i have to try and tell these stories mm. um you know tell some of them like you're sitting in a pub mm. like you're telling this stuff Right. Uh, and I mean, I do think, I mean, you know, people have their own traditions of, of, of telling stories. There's a lot of great traditions in, in you know, Mexico. And I've got a, a, a friend who's a writer here who says that he imagines just telling the stories to his mum. 
Sure. That's his, you know, he talks to his mum a lot and telling the stories to his mum is the way he does it. Right. Everyone got their own way, but I think, uh, I think telling stories is important. I think, uh, you know, and, and it's, it's important to make the stuff interesting mm. when you can write about a conflict in which maybe 200,000 people have died mm. and you make that boring. You know, that's mm. a, that's a crime. Sure. <laughs> that's a crime in sure. itself. Yes. You were talking about the great George Orwell and I, I'm thinking of, um, I don't know if you've read the piece, uh, Shooting an Elephant. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. You know, as a high school English teacher, I've taught that so many times mm -hmm. when we deal with like imperialism and stuff. And that's one that's just memorable, so memorable, right? Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. Um, I mean, he, uh, the thing about Orwell's writing, I mean, I mean, the many things about Orwell's writing. I mean, if you look at his descriptions when he's, I mean, down and out in Paris and London and, and, and his very vivid descriptions with yes. very kind of sparse use of words. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's interesting about him is you read some of the writers from his period and from his background, and they sound, the, the writing sounds to me posh. I hear a posh mm -hmm. voice in the writing, mm -hmm. and you don't hear that with George Orwell. He's got this kind of clarity yes. in his writing that kind of uh, transcends uh, social class almost, and mm -hmm. kind of very, very universal. He's got this real uh, power. Um, and it's, you know, it, you know, I think he really cares. Um, that's the thing that some things about him. I think he really, he really does care about this stuff. He really cares about, um, about the, the miners in, in, in Wigan and, you know, and the, uh, in the road to Wigan Pier. And sure. um, yeah, I mean, and then, then he wrote his masterpieces, um, you know, in 1984. <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah. you know we, we, could, we could spend uh, an hour <laughs> just talking about 1984, but I mean, what led to writing those masterpieces was this whole you know journey that he went through which is quite yeah. incredible yeah yeah so so he wrote very you know very um economically etc like you talk about and i feel like you know you being in mexico city what what would they call the other writers in in your city what, what they call them fresas right is a fresa kind of an up uppity kind of nose in the air type of thing well <laughs> fresa in mexico city um or, or in mexico it, it, it's got a couple of meanings. It's like mm -hmm. fresa is, it, it can mean particularly young, affluent people with a yeah. certain accent can be mm -hmm. fresa, who kind of, who kind of feel, um, you know, wearing nice designer clothes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but also it can be just like fresa can just simply be like somebody's fresa because they're liking certain styles. Okay. Um, you know, like, uh, you know, like, but it, you know, it's, it's, you know, within, within Mexican society uh, and within Mexican writers and journalists, there's actually great voices, I think, from across the class spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I think, you know, there, there's, there are great voices, great writers, um, great journalists coming from more upper middle class backgrounds mm -hmm. and, and some coming from poor backgrounds. I mean, journalism here, is a very broad thing. It stretches right across uh, yeah. these different social classes. Um, but yeah, you know, I, you know, I, I, I don't think. Uh, I mean, I you know, we used to have um, in prejudices in England in, in different directions, very much associated with social class uh -huh. in different directions. But I think as you get older um, and leave the country, and I've been away 20 years, you can kind of leave some mm. of that baggage behind. And I sure. think sometimes, uh, you know, whatever, I wouldn't, I wouldn't look, I wouldn't look down on, on a writer for, for being fresa or for <laughs> being barrio. You know, yeah, like, right, 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 right. Where they come from, you know, where they come from, they come from. There you go. As you, as you got older, you talked about getting back into journalism and writing. Um, and even, you know, even today, who are, we were talking earlier about Michoacan. We'll talk more, you know, like, I mean, Sam Quinones, of course, had some great pieces about that particular region and, and Mexico as a whole. Um, but who are, who are some of the writers who have inspired you, who continue to inspire you, whether it's the, the literal, you know, whether it's the type of writing that you do, that same genre or, or something else? So um, talking about, um, you know, more general writing about non-fiction mm -hmm. long-form writing mm -hmm. um i would say some of the books i, I find inspiring I, I tend to i mean i read kind of far and wide and tend to read a lot outside of just you know you know the crime stuff 
Sure. Um, but uh, you know, there, there's great stuff everywhere. But you know, from anybody from Kapuscinski, the famous mm. Polish uh, kind of journalistic writer, mm -hmm. um, who wrote, you know, traveled around and kind of wrote fascinating stuff and his kind of big picture, little picture kind of visions there. Um, to a British r contemporary writer called John Ronson. Okay, yeah. Um, who wrote these things like the psychopath test. And so you've been publicly shamed. Mm -hmm. um, and I think his stuff is brilliant. Some of the best nonfiction writing out there that he that he can, you know, very, just his, his use of sentences, his description of characters, his very, very dynamic stuff. I like um, the writer Yuval Harari. Um, for his kind of big visionary stuff that, that he kind of brings. Uh, in terms of the nonfiction crime writing, I like Nicholas Pileggi, who wrote Good Wise, Guy. Wise Guys, mm -hmm. uh, wrote Casino. Um, I mean, that, you know, that's, that's just very, very vivid and, and getting to very deep descriptions and stuff. Um, in terms of the Latin American uh, writers or, or journalists, there's, you know, a, a huge amount of colleagues with very deep knowledge um, and, you know, spending time in the field with people who have, you know, there's people like Jesus Lemus, who's a guy who grew up in Michoacan. Okay. Um, from a small town, um, was exposed uh, a federal deputy for links to the cartel. Mm. In revenge, was accused of being a member of the cartel. Wow. Was imprisoned in a federal prison um, alongside top cartel guys. When he came in, they all thought he was like La Familia Majorcana. Mm. Um, he, know, he knew personally, um, I mean, Carol Quintero, you know, loads wow. of his top cartel members. I would ask him like these different, sometimes these cartel guys, you know, remember what about Gags the Wall? I would like say, um, what about this guy? This is his nickname, right? And he goes, I don't, don't, don't call him that nickname. He gets really angry. Uh -huh. call him that nickname. So, so I mean, that, that kind of depth of knowledge. Right. Uh, I, I mean, I think he must, might be the journalist who, who knows most about this, mm -hmm. uh, or at least from that angle, um, to the late Javier Valdez, mm -hmm. who was, murdered in 2017 i think his writing is fascinating i think he's um i mean in spanish but you know his columns which he called la mala hierba um which are these you know uh, columns he wrote in in the in the newspaper rio doce mm -hmm. um are you know great um columns with these fascinating stuff and he really had this kind of norman mailer type mm -hmm. um kind of uh, thing very very special kind of writing down to um in central america el faro is is a fascinating news outlet run by a bunch of journalists down there who do very interesting stuff on on gangs on the central american gangs so mm -hmm. so yeah there, there's yeah huge amount of writing out there and a lot of very i mean very brave um yes um uh, female journalists uh from mexico that are really um made a lot of waves the last few years, including Annabel Hernandez, mm -hmm. who, who wrote uh, a bunch of books um, and who's, who's an incredible character as well. And, you know, uh, talking and covering and, and, and this kind of a uh, braveness of confronting really powerful figures and then right. fleeing the country and right. you know, in exile because of the, the threats. And so, yeah, so I, I feel kind of uh, quite an incredible generation overall of, mm -hmm. of, of Mexican journalists uh, that yeah. I've been around. Yes. Um, you, you pay a, a beautiful tribute to Javier Valdez in, in, in the book. Um, I believe you were saying that like he has a Twitter account or social media account that still tweets as him. Am I correct yeah. in saying that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, there was wow. kind of a, a, an effort by journalists to, or certain groups to have the kind of, with, with the permission of family members, mm -hmm. to kind of retweet in the, in the words and the faces of these people who mm -hmm. had died and kind of keep their, their idea they're still alive and they're still kind of fighting. Because, you know, you've had uh, 150 Mexican journalists be murdered mm -hmm. since, uh, since 2000. Mm. Uh, you know that's that's just 
an incredible systematic attack on 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 freedom of expression in Mexico and on, right. on, on journalists as a profession, mm. particularly on journalists who cover crime and, and, mm. and corruption and these kind of things. And so it's kind of fighting back, but it is, but I mean, they've been resilient. I mean, there's still people yeah. out there who are doing stuff, you know, there's still people out there having it, you know, doing exposés, um, reporting on this stuff. So, so it hasn't, the, the, the profession hasn't died. Mm-hmm. I have a recommendation for you. If you have not read it, maybe you have is Unforgetting by Roberto Lovato. Mm, yeah, about, yeah. About El Salvador. And, you know, it's a, it's a family history linked with the history of El Salvador. It's, uh, it's an incredible read. It really mm. is. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about your, your writing. Um, so you jumped uh, to journalism in Mexico City off, right off the bat from England. Is that mm. correct? Yeah. 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 And, um, you know, and you began to focus on Mexico and Latin America, obviously being where you were. What um, what led you into El Narco? I mean, I know there's probably a 10 or 11 year gap in there. You know, what were you writing? Were you writing just about cartel violence and crime or were you doing other type of writing? So the first job I got was at this newspaper in Mexico City called The News, which was an English language newspaper. OK, so back in those days in, in 2000 one 2002 it was sold physically in newsstands that was quite nice actually being an old right. fashioned newsroom and working on a newspaper and then seeing it on the newsstands in sure. Mexico City the next day <laughs> kind of quaint and, these days right <laughs> yeah yeah kind of quaint. i'm glad i got my start doing that and mm-hmm. so i did that and i actually began in the culture section but i was doing right away in the culture section i was doing some things on like graffiti artists and hip-hop mm-hmm. and kind of okay. gang related stuff there looking at these issues and then i got into um the general news section and i started focusing on crime Mm -hmm. right away i kind of carved that out as a beat i kind of fell naturally into it so from the early days then this was 2002 i was covering crime and covering these 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 stories and these kind of cartel stories and then um from there i went to work for the houston chronicle Mm -hmm. as a what's called a super stringer Again, it was a bit. This is a bit old school stuff that doesn't really exist. These opportunities, opportunities anymore. But it was when the Houston Chronicle had um, a bureau in Mexico. It had a bureau chief, and I was the number two. You know, beyond the bureau chief, mm-hmm. the bureau chief at the time was also traveling around the world, doing stuff in Saudi Arabia, Nigeria. So I'd do a lot of the Mexican coverage. So I was working for the Houston Chronicle, two thousand three, two thousand four, two thousand five, and at that time I began covering the beginning of the of really of the, of the Mexican narco war, the Mexican drug war. And I believe it really began in the city of Nuevo Laredo, okay. south over the border from Laredo, Texas. Mm-hmm. Now that was where from 2004, five, you had this clash of the Sinaloa cartel against the local Gulf cartel and setas. And they had this clash there. And that was a sea change mm. in the Mexican drug violence because instead of regular gut kind of gang members with shaved heads and tattoos shooting with pistols it was the set as these ex-military guys with metal helmets bulletproof vests ak-47s radios that was Mm -hmm. that's how we're going to do violence and changing the game Mm -hmm. of how these turf wars are being fought now in those days there was less um less uh, awareness of the danger that the levels of violence had not exploded in Mexico. So I would simply fly from Mexico City to Monterrey, mm-hmm. go to the airport, rent a car, drive by myself to Nuevo Laredo, snoop around the city, you know, trying to gather stuff. And mm-hmm. at the time there was a kind of old fashioned newspaper battle between the Houston Chronicle, the Dallas Morning News and the San Antonio Express mm-hmm. for news about this like rising violence on the border. Sure. Um, and it was kind of a local regional story. It hadn't got the international attention. Now I was facing off then against a very experienced journalist for the Dallas Morning News called Alfredo Corchado, uh, you know, a legendary journalist yes. um, and who was really kind of hitting his peak face. So it was very, very tough as a, as a young green journalist facing off against him uh, with this stuff. But so I started looking around for stories and, and, and because I'd grown up and have grown up very much around drug use and drug addiction I kind of thought well that's one way into this so one of the things I did in in Nuevo Laredo was hang around drug rehab places Mm. and then into prisons and start kind of working more up from from the bottom 
yeah. um, as well as kind of pursuing the police stuff. And, and then I, I worked for a while at the Associated Press, the news agency, um, worked with them for a couple of years, um, um, did, did some, did still do, do some drug stuff, but, you know, I was also covering the election and mm -hmm. this kind of protests and other stuff there. And then when I left the Associated Press in 2007, um, so I left it right in 2007, went back to the freelancing and I started working with Time Magazine and, and getting doing it in some, some TV uh, mm -hmm. documentaries. And then I was there right in 2008 when this violence really exploded. Mm. And so then it was in 2008, and I was, then I was covering Sinaloa very heavily. I was up in Sinaloa, you know, a lot in the summer of 2008, which was a long, hot, bloody summer in Sinaloa. I bet. Um, when you had this turf war between El Chapo and Beltran Leyva, this breaking up civil war within the Sinaloa cartel. So I was covering that and then uh, I remember quite clearly I was during that long hot bloody summer I was in a town called El Pozo uh, looking at where there'd been two massacres and I saw this big caravan like a convoy of trucks leaving the town like refugees with all their stuff after these massacres and it was like wow this is this is big mm. this, this is something big happening here this is shaking the country mm -hmm. you know, you've got these cartels which are getting more and more militarized which of this violence, which is going up like this, yes. this is going to destabilize the country. Yeah. Um, and I can't tell this anymore in, in just simple newspaper stories, magazine stories, short news segments. I need to write a book about this to tell this story. Mm -hmm. So it was in late 2008, I made the proposal for El Narco mm -hmm. um, and it got accepted in 2009. Uh, and then I, I, I wrote it and it finally got published in 2011. Mm -hmm. So, you know, being that it is about that that three or four year span or, or whatever and then you know with uh blood gun money which is the more recent one but then with um with gangster warlords in between one of the four parts of gangster warlords one of the four main you know areas you you um explore is michoacan la familia michoacana los, Tem los templarios is that the the huh. name and it really is interesting to to chart the growth or lack of or or the you know de-evolution um, between that because with with El Narco right it was still pretty new like you said and you, like you talk about you were you know traveling I think what you're getting at is that you were traveling without a lot of security which you would never do as you got well, older, as, as, uh, as things got more ex intense well I I don't like using security I mean there's, there's, okay. there's different ways of, of you know of doing this. Some TV crews will come and have security. I don't think it's particularly helpful uh -huh. here. Um, I, I coordinate in different ways, but what I mean is, in terms of the media outlets, sure. Like yeah. now, a lot of uh, media outlets are going to ask for security reports. Yeah, some of them will want to use security. Mm -hmm. um, some of them won't want to go to certain places. Back mm -hmm. then, there was none of it. Back yes. then, it was just like yes. um, the newspaper editor was just like, "Get your ass up to." Mm -hmm. the border and cover this story mm -hmm. that, that was literally the instruction just get up <laughs> right, there I remember, right, I, remember right. I, was, you know, I was a little right. bit like um yeah. you know because you know the first time i remember you know i, I wasn't used to, to scrambling i was a bit slow oh, i can't go mm -hmm. tomorrow and, and my editor was like just get up there and cover mm -hmm. this story yeah you know, just get up there and do it and and that, yeah. and that was good you know that was that was old school yeah. newspapers and i was glad to have lived through some of that you know old school newspaper mm -hmm. you know, how they used to work yeah. and now it's a very very different game yeah so i guess the common story you know for someone like me who's read a little bit but obviously is nowhere near an expert would be that it, you know it kind of started like an uruapan michoacan with the you know with the disco you know where they came in with the you know decapitations and that just horrific ter terrorist type of event but you make the case obviously very strongly that it was more like the nuevo loreto like you just talked about was is it safe to say that with the PRI out of out of power and that transition that that was a huge was it was it something in the past where it's kind of like hey we're aware of El Chapo and those type of people but we're kind of helping them out where we can kind of keeping them quiet I know it's hard to sum up in a sentence or two but what just led to the absolute explosion of you know the drug war or narco war whatever you want to call it yeah, I think the, the big picture in my interpretation is mm -hmm. that you had 71 years, 72 years of continuous rule by the P 
PRI, the, the Institutional Revolutionary Party. Mm -hmm. And so they ruled as drug trafficking emerged and grew, or even emerged, you know, before them, but, it, you know, it grew much bigger during them, you know, during this whole thing. Yeah. So they were, um, they, during the 20th century, during the mid to late 20th century, they had very much power over almost all aspects of Mexican society mm -hmm. in a kind of way through pyramids of control, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, there's a local village and that's got a local boss and then that local boss is going to like uh, obey some kind of regional power yeah. figure who will then kind of up to the kind of high up. So kind of, kind of pyramids of power is the way I see kind of how, how they functioned and, and, and drug trafficking they saw in the same way. Mm -hmm. So you develop this system of plazas um, where the, this kind of based around police districts where certain drug traffickers become the heads of the plazas mm -hmm. and they're reporting with the police and the power structure and the police are kind of overseeing the mafia. So kind mm -hmm. of acting in some ways, the state right. is acting like the mafia right. bosses right. overseeing crime. When Mexico moved from one party rule to multi-party democracy in this big hope, you know, in tune with what was happening around the world, mm -hmm. then this power structure changed. So suddenly you had, you, you had different state governors of different parties, different mayors of different parties, different police chiefs. Mm -hmm. And it's not like they suddenly became honest. They were still like, let's get some money from the drug trade, but it wasn't clear anymore Okay. You know exactly who's paying or competing about who's paying who. Mm -hmm. Now, within this change and the drug traffickers that have been getting increasingly wealthy over decades and decades, uh, and then began to realize that they would use violence more, the state was becoming weaker and more disorganized, and they would use their own violence more mm -hmm. to determine these. Uh, and use the state themselves but they kind of fighting over who could control so you kind of saw this reversal in this change rather than the, the police being the bosses over the narcos the narcos kind of fighting and telling the police you're going to have to work with us and, and, mm -hmm. and then fighting and killing police so then you know within this you have this rise of the cartels as these criminal stroke paramilitary stroke popular rock stars in the uh -huh. pattern of imagination uh -huh. emerging so suddenly you know what el chapo becomes in the 20 hundreds and 2010s what you know el mencho has now become what mm. el mas loco becomes in 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 uh michoacan mm -hmm. um you know these figures become these you know figures in the popular imagination and the cartels have these you know very much uh, power in communities mm -hmm. at the same time these business criminal business empires and at the same time this use of violence and they're working with elements of government but fighting against them so it's very very complicated but very very brutal violence that kind of consumes mexico in this period yeah well i mean the, the brutal violence that you talk about um you you start off el narco with um you know basically you said you know recounting the interviews you had with um uh, his name is escaping me right now, but he's, you know, he's in prison, right? And he just, you get right into it and he talks about just brutal, brutal things that he's done. And he's now, you know, trying to, with his Christian faith, you know, et cetera, trying to get over that. But you, you do an incredible job at, I don't, I don't think it's possible to ever say, you know, how has such brutality taken place? How can a human being be so brutal? But you do with, you know, throughout all your books, you do an incredible job of telling their personal stories and giving us some sort of, I don't know if sympathy is the word, but, but yeah, I mean, you start off on narco and it's like, whoa, okay. We, we, we get what's going on here. This is pretty impressive. Yeah. I mean, you know, this is you know, like, like everything in the world, this is a collection of real people living mm -hmm. this stuff mm -hmm. and doing it. And so one of the things I don't know a lot is document the lives of criminals, mm -hmm. the lives of narcos the lives of people in this world as well as the lives of victims and and, mm -hmm. and, and families who've suffered and, mm -hmm. and all kinds of people but if you look at the, the criminals i mean you know, i 
approach these as, as kind of life stories. There's, there's their life stories, it's their experience. Who are they? How they come into this? How they live through this? Mm-hmm. Uh, how do they uh, justify the violence in their own mind? How do they feel guilty or not about the violence they commit? Uh, how you know? What are their hopes? What are their dreams? Uh, you know, all of these things, uh, and that's yeah, a lot of what the work is focused on. Uh, and yeah, you have tormented people. Uh, they're kind of victims and victimizers. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know it's a bloody situation it's a conflict situation so i consider it a a hybrid armed conflict right hybrid war uh this is so like in anybody i mean you know it's like if you talk to vietnam vets i mean that's what some of them are like or some of them are like you know war criminals i mean if you know look at like you know serbian war criminals whatever Mm -hmm. out of these massacres i mean you know Mm -hmm. that's the kind of you know profile of some of these what people are like Mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah, I do look at the nature of evil acts, the nature of evil being, you know, evil acts being committed, uh, people being tortured, having their heads cut off, cannibalism, all of this stuff, which happens, massacres of 72 migrants, yeah. bodies cut up, arms, legs, heads cut off, you know, this has been happening. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, why are people doing that? You know what? What's, what's it like for them doing that as well as you know for the people um, who who experience the violence or yeah. you know survive experiencing the violence because right. a lot of them are, are, right. are dead. Um, so I just I realized my WhatsApp. I'm, I'm going to quit WhatsApp. I suddenly no realized problem. it, was, it, it no made problem. that bleep. I also should have forgot, forgot what about when we started. Um, okay. Mm-hmm. What? Yeah, I mean, I, and I hope it's not too personal of a question, but I wonder, you know, how do you how do you take care of your mental health? I mean, having seen you, you describe being seeing all kinds of atrocities or the after effects of atrocities. I mean, how have you been able to keep, you know, your mental health and that kind of thing? Sure, yeah. Um, well, I think, um, you know, you you have to try and and take it in mm-hmm. you know you, you create certain shields that you you do put shields up and and, and try and hold your calm in these situations mm-hmm. uh which can then make you a bit you know you have to be careful of how unsensitive that can make you to kind of death and, and, and bloodiness mm-hmm. um but it is important job to do so i see this as like right. a kind of, uh, go and do this job try and do it professionally right um, you want to hold yourself together and, and cover this stuff and get these testimonies sure um, they're an important testimonies yeah. uh it's you know when you're dealing with people who are suffering or people who have you know these things and, and, and they're like they also you know in some cases hoping you're going to give them more and you're just somebody who's arriving there to take stories away from people you know somebody whose mm-hmm. kid has been disappeared or or somebody who's been uh, unfairly arrested and you know you, you could do your job as a journalist you, you know you're sure. trying to get to these jobs but being around the, uh, the 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 physical flesh the bodies um sure is taking it in perspective uh i think in terms of mental health overall uh, i think we're all living i think I, I think we all live in a challenge a challenging mental health environment mm. in the 21st century yeah um, i mean right now i mean with covid with social media with our sense of self with drug addiction all of these things i think creates a challenging mental health environment uh and Actually, you know, I think it's one more thing to take in. I don't necessarily think it's worse. I think things like social media, things like bullying right. can be worse for somebody's mental health than covering uh, bloodshed. Uh, I wouldn't say I have the shell shock or kind of post-traumatic stress of people who have been around constant gunfire. I think, I think, mm. I think there's, a, there's a particular issue i have been around gunfire um on on several occasions but i think it's different when people are um covering or experiencing a soldier's constant gunfire and bombing all the time i think that creates quite a special condition in terms of what 
we used to call shell shock, which mm. my grandfather had. He fought in the First World War mm. and had kind of shell shock from being in the trenches right. a couple of years. And, and, and there's some journalists who I know have covered that kind of constant gunfire who have that, I think, more particular shell shock to that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't have that, but I do sometimes, you know, have these, you know, little, you know, little things of references or remember, you know, kind of, you know, some of these things. You know, I do have them with me, certainly. I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I can't even imagine how how hard it is to keep that balance between the journalistic integrity and, you know, being a human being. But, but you, you pulled off very well. I mean, in um, you have the story of 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 Kateri. Am I saying her name correctly? The, correct. I mean, um, that's in the most recent one. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. In, in fact, uh, in fact, she she has uh, she she passed away. Oh uh, boy. Um, oh. She passed away. I spoke to her mother about a week ago. Um, when I um, I when I published the book and I sent the photograph over to a friend in Honduras and said she passed away last year. Mm. Um, and I think so. So to, if people aren't aware of the story with her, Kateri was was a girl in in Honduras who was hit by a stray bullet um, from a gang fight and when she was 12 years old and the bullet entered just above her waist and she was paralyzed from the waist down and confined to a wheelchair which is very hard living in a very poor violent neighborhood in in, in San Pedro Sula Honduras she you know didn't go to school she gave up school because there were no wheelchair ramps mm. just lying at home um last year so i interviewed her when she was 14 in 2017 so last year when she was about 17 uh she got uh complications i think from 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 being confined mm. to a wheelchair mm. there's certain blood circulation complications right. she got sick mm. um and she passed away yeah. I'm so sorry to hear that. Yeah. I mean, you, you describe, you know, becoming very emotional about her story and it's easy to do so in reading the book. Mm. Um, you know, and so, you know, you're not a robot obviously, and you, 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 you report the facts very well, but also you in the, at the right times you, you put in your own personal views and that, that makes the, the books even better. And I'm so sorry to hear about hers. Um, you mentioned in, in the book, the, the famous or infamous quote from Stalin about, mm. you know, a single death, a million deaths is a statistic, a single death is a tragedy. Mm. And you, you know, you tell the story of, of Javier uh, Valdez, the, the journalist of Katari, and it reminds us, it reminds us about that, you know, I mean, you could use that Stalin quote to talk about the whole drug war in general, right? But mm. we just get desensitized to all of these things, but you're able to, to put these personal stories that's, um, that, that make, make us, sympathetic empathetic and and add to the greatness of the books yeah i mean well i mean if you look overall in the last 20 years in latin america it's been more than two million murders um it's the most murderous region in the world Mm -hmm. um whereas much of the world in the 20 hundreds got safer latin america became more violent right overall uh so we've got this you know what i describe as a chain of crime wars kind of goes through the continent um, you know, these weird things, you know, with these weird hybrid armed conflicts or levels mm-hmm. of violence and kind of suffering. But yeah, I mean, each of the, you know, these, you hear a couple of million or you hear a couple of hundred thousand deaths in Mexico and it, it's hard to envision yeah. that in human terms, but, right. but human stories is the, the quote attributed to Stalin is one of these quotes uh, like, um, right. So right. yeah, Stalin said it, did he really? It's yeah. like a, another one I, I, I quote in the, Actually, I, I don't quote it in this book. I quote it in this story. Mm. I only fa- only saw this. I only found this um, uh, recently. One of the firearms um, actually in the Mexican narco museum um, was, and I didn't. I, I'd, I'd taken this film of it, but I only noticed looking at the the film was engraved, or somebody pointed it out to me, was engraved with mm-hmm. the saying, um, um, "Only the dead have seen the end of the war." Uh, and it was, uh, it's attributed to Plato. Although uh, some people say, you know, is it? No, did Plato really say it? Yeah. But anyway, one of those things that he, he, his name is associated with that quote. Right, right. In, uh, in the uh, Gangster Warlords, you, you deal with the Red Commando of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Uh, the, the Dons or Dons, I don't know how they say it, you know, Don, like Don Corleone. The, Don, the Dons, Don Corleone of, uh-huh. of Jamaica. 
of, of, of Kingston specifically, I believe, right? Kingston, yeah, Jamaica. yeah, basically Kingston. I mean, there are some, I think there's some, some Dons, uh, maybe Montego, based on my places, but like Kingston is, 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 mm -hmm. is the, the vast majority. And then the Matas, which is really interesting, you know, I mean, a lot of people know a decent amount about El Salvador and you, you deal with more with Honduras, which is, you know, it's just interesting. And then, of course, La Familia Michoacana, which became the Templarios um, with Nazario and the out of the fences and all that. Um, and again, you know, you, you, you put the personal stories and you, individual stories and you talk about what led to all four of those. And then you really bring them together in the end. Um, I was interested in, in the book, you talk about some horrible things that go on in the garrisons, which is the Jamaican neighborhoods, you know, the the in Michoacan, in Honduras, in the commandos and the favelas. But you also mentioned that these are some of the most giving, selfless people. Uh, they're warm and open people. I don't know how much you've thought about, like, how does such brutality exist, coexist with openness, friendliness, warmth? I don't, yeah. know if, I don't know if you can answer that question. It's kind of yeah, a yeah, yeah. topic there. No, it's, it's something I think about a lot, and, and 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 I mean totally. I mean, like you know, both within communities and within individuals. Mm -hmm. to speak of this, you know, human beings are complicated, and, and and things are complicated. So, so I mean, like, and that's why you know, like, uh, you know, um, a lot of these communities, um, you know, spending time in in the favela in Brazil, the favelas, the the um, ghettos of of Rio de Janeiro, um, the garrisons in Jamaica, you know, they are it is enjoyable to go in there and spend time with this. I can't lie. Mm -hmm. And there's an excitement about, you know, it's not all, you know, horror. There's an right. excitement about, you know, these are often areas with a lot of young people um, and a lot of uh, interesting counterculture. So in, sure. in, in, in the favelas in Brazil, they have their music, the funk, the favela funk, Mm. which is you know, the big sound systems and playing and people dancing and guys dancing around with firearms and <laughs> these free parties they're, they're throwing and mm -hmm. in Jamaica the um you know dance hall and reggae and and and, and this music and um and, and you you have these you know in, in these areas you know that that's that, that's part of it and and uh, the but also you know a lot of people who will be um yeah you know the general generosity of spirit um you know mm. people who will um, talk and tell their stories and, 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 and invite sure. you in and, um, and not have particular hang-ups uh, mm -hmm. about or, or not be laying on a kind of attitude of kind of, you know, who are you coming in here? You know, like you might expect um, actually just being like, hey, come on, come on for a drink. Let's talk about this. Mm -hmm. Let's talk. Let's talk. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I, I, and that's, that's part. Now, I think, you know, the, I would say that the reason behind a lot of these contradictions is that a lot of this um, violence is really about very about, about circumstances. Mm -hmm. There's structural issues behind it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not about individual meanness. Right. Uh, right. Although, you know, individuals can be <laughs> also can be mean and, 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 and kind and, you know, Quite human right. beings are full of contradictions, but it's not, you know, overall, it's, I would say it's more about, structural things you know like um so you have in these areas you have organized crime i think has, has filled certain gaps in these areas it's filled mm -hmm. certain gaps of of governability mm -hmm. um there's weird circles where you have a lack of justice system like a lack of a lack of police mm -hmm. actually providing police and justice in these areas mm -hmm. so the organized crime groups become in a way like power like police in these areas sure. so you see in, you know in the garrisons of jamaica them having their own prisons and saying this is our prison we're we'll calling yeah. that and then somebody who's accused of you know you know one you know, this guy described how you know this uh guy's accused of, of raping his sister and they say okay we'll go we'll go there with our guys with the guns and then and then you who your sister was raped you get to beat the guy with a stick Mm. You know, so, so you know we're going to provide a justice and take care of things within our community right um you know brutally um that's you know that's <laughs> the way things are yeah. um but again it's not really about individual meanness it's about why these structures there and you know mm -hmm. why you have this massive inequality sure. why you have these um 
the rule of law not functioning mm -hmm. in much of Latin America and the Caribbean, and particularly in sections of society in, in, in Latin America and the Caribbean. Yeah. Uh, I want to move on to the to, to the most recent book. Congratulations! You know, it's I mean, I think it's published in February, maybe. So Correct. it's very new, right? Um, you know, the, especially in the United States, the gun debate it's been it's been going on and on and on. And I've you know we feel like we've heard it all. We haven't. Mm -hmm. You you describe um, I mean, you know, just again another argument for long form is a must. You talk mm -hmm. about social media and Twitter and all that. Like you get these sound bites, you know, and you get these little everyone's got an opinion, but I mean, you go into great depth, mm. um, great depth. Uh, you start off by talking about the El Chapo trial and, you know, which ostensibly is about drugs, drugs, drugs. And you're like, well, it's also about guns, mm. right? Am I correct that you were actually there when, you know, they were yeah. like displaying some of that incredible firepower, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The journalists were like, hmm. Like, I'm sure it wasn't the first time you thought about it, of course. Yeah, 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 uh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, the, the, I mean, the El Chapo trial, I think is symbolic. I mean, you know, it was also, I see the three books as a, a kind of trilogy and mm -hmm. I thought that the no El Chapo thing was a very important part of this. But I think, you know, they, this was the ultimate um, US trial of uh, a Latin American drug trafficker. This is kind of a accumulation of the war on drugs. Uh, but it was interesting the way they dealt with the firearms issue. Like they, 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 they said, um, well, El Chapo is also a prolific firearms trafficker and he's taking thousands of guns down to hit men to fight a war in Mexico. And this is the language the prosecutors are using, but they're not trying him for that. They're trying him for drug selling. And then one of the reasons, you know, is because there is no federal firearms trafficking law in the United States. Mm -hmm. Another reason is because you've got, you know, things like the Fast and Furious scandal, which was also connected to El Chapo because guns from Fast and Furious were found in the very last safe house of El Chapo and Fast and Furious is a botched operation right, by right. American federal agents, the, the ATF, um, in terms of trying to bust uh, a trafficking ring of firearms to Mexico and ended up uh, being complicit to an extent of watching right. almost 2,000 firearms be trafficked to cartels. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the... Uh... You know some of the numbers you throw out there that the U.S. has 393 million guns in civilian hands, um, more than the next 25 countries combined, um, and then 200,000 guns trafficked over the border each year. You know approximately, which is around 2.5 million over a decade. In 2018, the ATF had a study that said that 70 percent ish of Mexican guns tested were from the U.S. I mean, um, you know you. A lot of people who would say, you know, oh, we, sh we shouldn't let people into the border, we shouldn't give them asylum, are the same people who say everyone should have a gun, but that allows the guns to go south, the Iron River you talk about. I mean, there's just so much like just head spinning type of information, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the fact that there's no federal, how did you phrase it? There's no federal guidelines? No federal on? firearms trafficking law in the United States. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, the issue of, of firearms trafficking to Mexico specifically. Mm -hmm. You know, like, so this is something which, you know, I've been reporting on and, and for many years, I thought it's a brick wall, you know, we can't get very far. Then I realized this is, is an issue which I should write more about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's kind of heartbreaking to think or mind boggling to think in the My time mind. that I've been in Mexico, this 20 years, you know, it, it's estimated to be several million guns that have been trafficked to Mexico in this time. Um, they continue every year. And this is, and then you've had this, hybrid armed conflict in Mexico. So this is a historic case mm -hmm. of, you know, continued arms trafficking to a very brutal armed conflict. Right. And so we really got to take this in, you know, at least to try and get this out there more in, in, in the debate narrative. And, and there is actually, it is actually something with low hanging fruit, I think, to mm -hmm. do something about. Yes. Um, and, and respecting the Second Amendment, respecting, you know, not even getting into that debate, Right, but just right. some basic enforcement of this, because you have cases where people are going into shops and buying 10 identical AK-47s and they're for the cartels and there's no red light being flashed or, or people who have gone in single pies to buy 85 guns or like supposed housewives buying six 
barrel fifties and paying over ten thousand dollars in cash for each one. There's a mm. basic enforcement. We haven't even tried that mm. on this issue yet, mm. um, and we're just basically giving the cartels the guns. No doubt about it. Um, and so, you know, you you then move on in the book to is it Jaime Zapata was the mm. the agent, right? He was killed in the in the tragic incident in Northeast Mexico, 2011. And you brilliantly and interestingly take those guns, the serial numbers, et cetera, and you trace them, you know, back to, well, you know, the, the, the forest uh, hidden gun armory, that's not the term, the shop, <laughs> the factory in Romania, in Germany, you know, where the guns are made, where those type of guns are that specific gun. Um, and you just sum up that journey. And it's an amazing one. That's not even taken into account. And you do later the, the loopholes, the gun shows, you know, all those things. It's amazing for you to trace that. I wonder if you've read um, Gomorra by Saviano, Roberto Saviano. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a great book. Yeah. He has that part where I think, I think he's talking about a, one of the gangsters, one of the Camoristas, who is such a fan of the AK-47 that he does like a pilgrimage Mm. To, go, to go see Kalishnikov. Mm. Like he brings them some fresh mozzarella, right? And it's just amazing. It's the same type of thing where it's like, and, and you quote Kalishnikov is, you know, I don't know if it's literally on his deathbed, but basically saying like, what have I done? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a, I think it's a fascinating part of this story mm -hmm. um, is, I mean, the bigger, wider story of what right. we're right. seeing in, in Latin America um, today, uh, but also it's connected to the United States very, very deeply, mm -hmm. is this hybrid conflicts are made possible, particularly because of the these type of guns. So the AK-47, the AR-15 variants. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, we can't unmake them now. They've been made, but yeah. it's interesting to look at this history. So you have... You know, the AK-47 was this revolutionary gun mm -hmm. made in the Cold War um, in 1947. And that had that revolutionized warfare. And then the um, United States, you know, wanted to make its own gun to rival the AK-47. Right, right. But you had uh, Gene Stoner um, in uh, a workshop in Hollywood, <laughs> of all places, mm -hmm. who was sitting there. Um, you know, how do I make a gun that can compete with the AK-47? He came up with the AR-15. Mm. Um, and then that was eventually adopted by the uh, American, turned into the M-16, and then they had the civilian version. Mm. Uh, and so you have these, those are the two main guns used by the cartels in Mexico. Mm. They often convert them to fully automatic in Mexico. You get a semi-automatic AK-47 or AR-15 and convert it to fully automatic here. Although in some ways it doesn't make that much difference in terms mm. of the combat itself. You can have a semi-automatic and it can do the job perfectly well of what they want to do, but they often do like to have fully automatic and just spray and just yeah, spray right, bullets right, at, these, right, right. at these victims. Uh, and so that's, yeah, that's a big part of, of that. Now we can't unmake them, mm -hmm. um, but we can think about how we try and live in a world where these guns are around, Yeah, um, you know, and, and how do we, you know, try and stop them getting to the most violent people Mm -hmm. um, who, who are committing, you know, whether it's a massacre of, of, of people here in Mexico or somebody sprang up a school in the United States. Um, you know, how, how do we try and stop those guns getting onto the trigger fingers of people who want to do harm? Right. Yeah. I mean, there's just so much about like, you know, people, Americans, whomever, just looking the other way, like, well, those guns are out there. And yeah, I sold them, like you said, to, you know, a housewife, she bought six of these, you know, military style rifles, but you know, I made my money. Whoop, I'm, you know, I'm following the law or not, but I was just going to read a little piece from, uh, from the Saviano. Mm. He's talking about the AK-47 as an indicator of so much. He says, nothing in the world, organic or synthetic metal or chemical has produced more deaths than the AK-47. It has killed more than the atom bombs dropped on Hir Hiroshima and Nagasaki, more than HIV, more than the bubonic plague, et cetera, et cetera an exponential amount of human flesh impossible to even imagine. To calculate the state's state of human rights, some analysts consider the price of an AK-47. The less it costs, the more human rights violations there are. I thought that was very interesting that, that yeah, yeah, analysts yeah. even study that. 
yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, inter interesting, yeah. Yeah, the price of the guns are interesting as well. I look at that there, the, the prices of the guns on the black market mm -hmm. and, and how they change. So I look at these kind of black market gunonomics mm -hmm. and right. so you see these kind of uh, issues of, you know, when there's more demand, the prices go up. So in Mitchell Can, um, in one of the most expensive prices I've seen for an AKs was in Mitchell um, in 2014 time when everybody wanted them, every, you know, because the, the whole state, everyone was out with a gun. So suddenly there was like $5,000. You know, right. suddenly come right up to, mm -hmm. you know, even though like you can buy one in, you know, in the States for $700 mm -hmm. in a shop. Uh, and then you know, often they'll go up triple the price. And then there'll be things like if a gun is used in a high level murder, sure. then the price will go down, it'll be devalued things so and then it become very very cheap mm -hmm. um, uh, if somebody is desperate for a gun then the gun seller the illegal gun seller knows that they see it on their face right. they see it right away these guys desperate he's calling up oh, that gun uh -huh. for me and so they'll quickly like put up the price so you see the way the prices vary mm -hmm. um and so yeah part of that for me was trying to make sense mm -hmm. and i think again this is this is part of what we need to, to understand is um, a lot of this is black markets, illegal markets, mm -hmm. illegal markets in drugs, illegal markets in guns, um, the illegal market controlled in human smuggling. These mm -hmm. things, I mean, it's like understanding black markets is a lot yeah, of how we yeah. have to understand the world today. Right. Obviously, I'm preaching to the choir here, but long form is a must. Long form is a must. I mean, you, everyone knows, okay, guns and, and drugs are related, but you do an incredible job about connecting those dots. Um, you know, a lot of people like myself know kind of vaguely, oh, these gun shows, they're bad. You go into great detail. Um, and I, what part was, one of the parts that was so interesting to me was this West Virginia, ATF has their West Virginia branch, right? That's like decidedly low tech. Mm. I wonder if you could maybe describe that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So, so in West Virginia is the ATF's National Trace Center. Uh -huh. So the, the place they have the national center they have for tracing all of the guns. So any guns, for example, you go to a crime scene, let's say, you know, uh, an example of somebody shoots somebody and drops the murder weapon. Mm -hmm. So you've literally got the smoking gun. And so you look, pick up the gun. Okay. Look at the serial number, phone up the trace center. Now, because of the way you've had these crazy fights over gun laws in the United States, it's illegal to have a digital trace system on this weapon. So what happens is they phone up and, and a lot of the, they say that the cops don't often know this. Mm -hmm. So some cop, you know, like it might be a cop in, a cop in Buffalo and he calls up national trace and I've got a gun, got a trace, you know, I've got a smoking gun. Let's do it. Yeah. Give me the number. Mm -hmm. and, and the guy there goes, Oh, you know, I can't do that. Oh, I have to phone up or email company that made the gun which could be in europe or it could be in the united states or whatever and then find out who they sold the gun to like which supplier then contact them and find out who they sold the gun to and then keep on going mm -hmm. now then then and then it's the average time is 11 days <laughs> so you've got like you know like a murder investigation that's a long time now because also they've got this weird stuff in the law that you can't have this now this comes back to the gun rights mm -hmm. um lobby the gun rights groups who they are, are very much have the fear of gun confiscation so they've got the fear of the government having lists of gun owners and lists of mm -hmm. guns and gonna uh, you know kick down the door and take all your guns away mm -hmm. so they don't want these things computerized now what happens is when a gun owner goes out of business and they've got all their paperwork then they don't want to just throw that in the in the garbage in the rubbish so they'll take that to the trace center. So you have these, so they keep it as papers. So you have these huge, huge piles of, of paperwork. Now, sometimes the, you know, and this is gonna get really weird. The gun owners themselves will have the stuff on a hard drive. So they'll take the hard drive and they'll print it out all the stuff and then okay. add it to the piles. Yeah. But then they're trying to get a way around it saying, okay, how, you know, we just can't deal with, you know, so you write these, these huge mountains of papers and, they can't deal with this saying, well, how about if we take photographs of the pieces of paper, put them on to like computers, but they're not searchable. They're simply bits and bits of paper. So we're not, and this is the kind of weird world they're living in 
Yeah. Um, and and they run they, they, they run the traces, they get the job done. They've mm-hmm. got these uh, people sitting there in these cubicles making these phone calls. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of a bizarre, uh, surreal system to see. That scene stood out so much. Those scenes stood out so much. It's just like such a microcosm of like American gun law and, you know, the Byzantine laws and this and that. You can do this. It just seems like, you know, the U.S. laws are just set up to like help people use guns guns to kill people you know and it just um uh, you know you talk about like okay these these drug wars these cartels such then you know these things are not going to end as long as there's a desire for drugs etc but like you talk about it's just low-hanging fruit it seems like you you give some solutions like these things are already in place this can be done i wonder if you can maybe talk about one or, or two of the really quick easy within the law without even you know delving into the second amendment solution yeah yeah Sure. So uh, the, the first thing is simply when you have, um, I, I mean, universal background checks. Um, mm-hmm. So you have the, the loophole, um, whereas people saying they're private collectors can sell guns with no paperwork at all. Um, and they can sell them no paperwork and no, and no check. Now that is being abused and this is very well documented. And I've got an interview that gun trafficker who was you know taking advantage of this being abused by people to 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 buy new guns brand new guns resell them mm-hmm. for markups saying they're just a collector they've got no license to sell weapons um so they're actually they the break they are breaking this existing law but it, 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 because you have this loophole it's so open right. to abuse so there's simply the idea of having universal background checks is that any time that a gun is sold mm-hmm. to somebody else you mm-hmm. do a check and you know it's the law like everything else yeah. you know the surveys have 89 percent of americans in favor 81 yes. percent of conservatives mm-hmm. the majority of gun owners but because of the way the politics have been played on this and the way that the nra what the nra has become and elements of the gun lobby is fighting this um, war to the death no compromise it's not sitting down and you know how can we deal with this issue it's mm-hmm. they want to take away our guns we've got to fight everything but also we're selling a lifestyle. So then we've got NRA TV and we've got NRA, you yeah. know, give, you know, give donations and, and you're part of this lifestyle and this kind mm-hmm. of, um, there's this thing. So there's, there's that one, universal background checks. There's a bill right now. Um, this could go through now. It's kind of could be Emin, it's part of this. Mm-hmm. Another thing which, which I, I, ha- I really don't see talked about much, but I think it's a very big issue in this is the issue of straw buyers. Right. So yeah. Somebody with a clean record and I'm going to pay you go to that shop, buy me a gun. Now, this is a, a big way of criminals acquiring guns, of cartels acquiring guns, gangs in America acquiring guns. And they do it, people do it, and often they're paid very little. They're paid, I mean, it was, this is, kind of blew my mind. Somebody, they often say, go, the, go in that shop and buy me a pistol. I'll give you $50. Mm. And they'll do it. Mm. Go in that shop and buy me, um, in this one case I've documented, go and buy me 10 AK-47s, so I'll pay you $600. Jeez. $60 a gun. Now they do it because the punishments are basically slap on the wrist. It's right, probation. right. Um, so I, I asked one of the ATF agents, said, what could really be done? He said, just put up the sentencing guidelines. Mm-hmm. If you, even under the law, they could give them prison. The crime, because there's no firearms trafficking law, the crime is lying on a form, mm-hmm. which is the official Jeez. crime. But even, even then, now if, if you could, especially if you can connect that crime to a murder, right. um, you know, if you can connect that crime to killing a child, and, and you went in there and you knew it was a cartel. You know, you knew you're dealing with the setas cartel. You knew you're dealing with, you know, violent gangsters. And you're going there and buying them a bunch of guns. You know, you know what those guys are going to do with those weapons. Yeah. So um, give them punishment. Yeah. You know, that's, you know, um, you know, and other things is like, you know, people go in there and they buy these, the Barrett 50s. So people aren't familiar with the Barrett 50s. These are firing big bullets this size. There's a, uh, these were used in, in, in the city of Kulakan in, in a mm. big fight between uh, gangsters and soldiers in 2019. There was video of this where they fired with a 50 Barrett 50 cal and it blew a soldier's leg off. The leg literally exploded. Oh. And, um, you know, just have an extended background check on these things. If you're just going to spend $15,000 on a Barrett 50, mm-hmm. you know, surely you can wait a couple of days you know, three days to have an extended background check. We just sure. check out: Are you really a legitimate hobbyist, 
or are you somebody buying as a straw buyer for a carter? Because I mean, who wants a 50 cal? Mm -hmm. so these, these are some of the basic stuff yes. um, that could have a massive impact. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, most, the vast majority of gun owners are not going to, are not going to care. Now there are some, you say the hardliners who are going to care and who, mm -hmm. you know, there's, you know, I do interview in the book, a member of a militia uh, who was there and he went to, went to Michigan and, and he considers Trump um, was too soft on guns because yeah. he banned bump stocks and you've right. got that, that fringe there yes you've got those hardliners there you're not going to convince them but the majority of gun owners mm -hmm. haven't got a problem with just you know having some basic enforcement on this stuff yeah the the last thing about about the the book and your trilogy in general um i wonder maybe a combination of what you think slash what is thought of in mexico if that can even be generalized but you know the idea of how much how much blame is on the united states you know we're for the we're the majority of the ones using the drugs um, you know, we're the ones with those ridiculous laws and loopholes and straw buyers that just have sent an absolute flood of, of weapons down to Mexico. I wonder what, kind of what the general thought is on where, you know, how much blame the U.S. should have. Well, when you, I would say it's, 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 it, it varies a bit. I mean, I think the United States has a responsibility mm -hmm. of this, but it's, it's not all on the United States. I mean, you know, also Mexico, you can't just blame everything on a different country. Uh, now, I think this varies a bit. When you have um, this, you know, some of the intellectuals will be more focused on this in the United States, and, and there is definitely, I mean, on the gun firearms issue, the United States is definitely, you know, the Mexico should focus on this, and the current foreign secretary mm -hmm. uh, is, you know, focusing on this issue. And they should. Do. When I ask this to uh, some of the people on the, you know, even victims, you know, mothers of kids have been dragged away and murdered, they'll often blame their own government more mm. than the United States. Mm -hmm. I often say, well, I'm, you, know, you know, my government didn't, didn't protect me, didn't deliver justice, mm -hmm. didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. um, now, you know, I, I see it, it's, it's both sides of the border and it's, mm. you know, it, it's a connected problem sure. or across Latin America. And it's just like, you know, there's, you know, there's stuff, you know, this, this, this has got to end sometime. Um, yeah. You think this this period of violence, this hybrid warfare has got to end sometime. Mm -hmm. Is it going to be ten years? Is it going to be twenty years? Thirty years? I don't know. Yeah. Um, we've got to, but we've got to, you know, try and push to to ending this. It's not a normal no. or a healthy state of affairs. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, this situation is something that I think you know that can be improved. Yeah. As far as it ending sooner rather than later, you know, oh, ojalá que sí, ojalá yeah, que yeah, sí. Yeah. We hope so. Um, I wonder if, if you wouldn't mind. It's a, it's a really short excerpt. I wonder if you maybe wouldn't mind reading the the last like paragraph or so. It's, it happens to be page three forty. It's page three forty four. Yeah. I, I think page three forty four. It, it starts in a starts and ends in a pretty easy place. Yeah. I would really appreciate that. Yeah. So so. Um. So the whole of three forty four. Yeah. If you wouldn't mind. Yes. Yeah. So I talk about the, the, it's talking about the narco museum, which is a museum of, right. of things uh, taken from uh, drug traffickers. And I say, opening this museum to the Mexican public would be tricky. It would be seen as glorifying the narcos in the midst of a war that rages fiercely. It has tributes to fallen soldiers who died fighting traffickers and a mural showing them in heroic poses against a demonic enemy but it lacks a tribute to the fallen civilians, to the disappeared, to the refugees. We can hope one day the Narco Museum will be opened up because the violence will be history, a past story of bloodshed that can be studied like the museums of the Mexican Revolution, the American Civil War, the violence of Al Capone. There will no longer be mass graves of 250 corpses, refugees in camps, drowning in feces on the US border, mothers scouring the earth for a sign of their sons and daughters. We can hope there can be a museum for the violence of Baltimore, remembering those bad old days when children were killed with stray bullets. We can hope that the era of mass shootings will be a phenomenon to study in the history books. Someday this will come to pass. Our efforts could make it happen sooner, but perhaps there is worse to come first. Thank you so much. You are not just an award-winning journalist, you know, 
uh, black and white, just, you know, some, some creative writing there definitely builds the, the pathos. I actually went as part of my uh, bachelor party weekend in Las Vegas, we went to that mob museum. Mm. And you make the great point that the mob museum, that's, it's, it's, what's the word? It's, uh, I was gonna say quiche. Um, it's, I can't think of the word, but you know, the idea that it, it talks about things that have happened in the past. Mm. And so that's, it's okay to study that. And it's okay to, oh, look at this. And, you know, not laugh and make fun, but it's different. And mm. the museum that you talk about is, you know, about what's going on now. And like you say very well, it's like, you know, let's, let's hope that that very soon, that's just a, a figment of the imagination. That's just a, you know, something of the past. So mm. thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you so much for your trilogy. Mm. What, uh, what's next? If, if you don't mind sharing, you don't have to, what's, uh, what yeah. are you working on? <laughs> Sure. Yeah. I mean, I mean, right now I'm, I'm still getting, I'm still promoting blood, God, money and getting this out. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, uh, I still, some, still some other projects I want to do in terms of documentary okay. connected to all of this. You know, I still have a lot of material, um, just to get out there in different forms. So I think in documentary and podcasts and that kind of thing. Uh, but after, I don't know, I mean, I, I kind of, I feel like, you know, a trilogy of books on this is, is, is enough books on this for the moment. Mm -hmm. So take a, breath i still want to carry on writing books but there's a big world out there and i've mm -hmm. written a lot about this and said a lot about what i can say about this mm -hmm. issue um but it, you know it carries on i mean and, and until my last breath i'm gonna i'm gonna uh, always be watching this and and, and, and and speaking and involved i mean I'm, I'm i've become too involved in these issues now yeah to, to walk away from it completely i gotta figure in your first conversations with people you've got a good in with your last name which whether it's italian or spanish is cricket right yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, Grillo, uh, Grillo. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a funny name, but but yeah. I, 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 I don't. I, mean, I think I think in terms. I mean, I do think in terms of journalism, that that anybody can can cover anything. I, mm -hmm. You know, it, I, I do think that there is. A, I mean, we're all individuals. We've all got our stories. We can all tell them in our own way. We can all bring mm -hmm. our own different um, mm -hmm. takes to the table. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I mean, yeah, I mean, I use that as a joke. Um, you know, Grillo, you know, I'm, I say that in Spanish, you know, Grillo Cantor, which is a you know, famous uh, a character um, from Veracruz mm -hmm. who had these children's thing called Grillo Cantor. So I'll, I'll uh, use that, that joke and then I'll, I'll kind of find a common ground with anybody I'm you know, talking to. But like, I think, mm -hmm. I mean, I think I still believe that... Um, you know, we can all ride and investigate things. It's, you know, we can be who we are and, and investigate and be humble and, um, you know, have humility, mm. but not necessarily caution. Because <laughs> sure. if I was sure. cautious, sure. I'd sure. never have done any of this. Yeah, uh, right. <laughs> but humility in terms of I can be like, um, I don't know. Yes. Yeah, sure. um, maybe I'm wrong. Um, and I'm going to sit back and listen to these people's mm -hmm. stories mm -hmm. and, and try and make some sense of this. That's great. And one of the books, you give the acknowledgement to one of your earlier bosses and you, you talk about that type of thing. Like, <clears throat> if I don't know, like, if you don't know, tell them you don't know and, and ask about it. And, and if you think you know, you, you don't know until you've checked it twice type of thing, right? So I know you're a very humble person and, uh, but, and you know, everyone's got to make, make money and this and that, but I appreciate you being very heroic and, uh, and going into some of these hor you know horrific situations and telling the stories of the survivors and the victims and all the above so thanks so much for your time i know you're in the middle of you know book promotion the whole deal thank you so much really really appreciate it great to be here you know thanks for reading thanks for all the feedback you know say so it, it really makes me um it all worthwhile i mean it you know, completes the circle of uh yeah. you know of, you know we can be driven to create and it, and it only makes it worthwhile um, or, or, or it really completes it when people read it and feed back and gives you inspiration to do more. So, so mm -hmm. look, I, I feel, I feel it's been, um, it, it all made sense to me. I, I do feel in, it, in its best form, writing, reporting, um, communicating is a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very challenging profession right now. Yes. Um, so, mm -hmm. so it's these kind of feedback, which, which makes it all worthwhile. Yeah. Continued great luck in your writing. And, and again, uh, thank you so much. Just a pleasure for me to, to work with you, to talk with you, and for everyone to hear. Thank you, everyone, for listening to episode 54 with Ion Grillo. 
You can now subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts and please leave a five-star review. You can also ask for the podcast by name using Alexa and find it on Stitcher, that's new, Spotify, and on Amazon Music. Follow me on Instagram where I'm at Chills at Will Podcast or on Twitter where I'm at Chills at Will PO1. This is a passion project of mine, a DIY operation. I'd love for your help in promoting what I'm convinced is a unique and spirited look at an often ignored art form. The intro song for the Chills of Will podcast is Wind Down Instrumental. And the other great song played on the episode was Hoops by Matt Whitehour. Both songs are used through archesaudio.com. For now, thanks again for listening. And I hope that these quarantine days bring you texts by writers with mad skills like Yon Grillo, whose work gives you chills at will.